The following program was previously streamed live. Visit sleepapnea.org to get more videos, audio, and blog content. Also, you can register at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation, and updated whenever new programs are available. It's all free. Thanks for joining us, and enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our weekly sleepapnea.org series. And we are pleased to have with us Dr. Anne Marie Morse uh, from the Geisinger Health System, uh, one of the few uh, top flight uh, health systems, one stop shops in this country that seem to be getting things right. And the reason I can say that from, uh, from an anecdotal pers- uh, perspective is that when I asked Dr. Morse, uh, if she was treating any patients with COVID right now, she says, thank God I'm not. Uh, and that means that they're doing things right up in uh, Philadelphia. So that being said, welcome, Dr. Morse. Thank you so much. Um, so even though we're close to Philadelphia, we still are a little bit uh, a distance away. We're about two and a half hours from Philadelphia. So we're more centrally located in Pennsylvania, um, ca- covering a relatively large catchment of about 47 counties um, outside of the Philadelphia area. So is, is, is if you're centrally located, so that means you see primarily a rural, a rural population or is there any urban or? So, so in general, our population is mostly a, a rural to suburban population. Mm-hmm. Um, we go all the way out to the Wilkes-Barre and Scranton area where it's a little bit more of an urban population, but right. um, one would argue that that even still is more of a suburban area. Uh, but that is one of the unique characteristics of our healthcare system is uh, definitely having um, a more rural landscape where our patients have to come for, from a, a wide distance. Uh, this definitely has been highlighted as uh, something that is very unique to our, our institution, but also uh, there is a significant component of um, COVID influencing our patient care and our rapid implementation of telemedicine and our successful uh, way of doing so. Uh, definitely helping our patients who, instead of having to typically travel two to three hours, uh, can now, from the comfort of their home, be able to get the care they need. So for the overall patients, that makes total sense in, in light of this this debacle that we're in, is that the whole model has sure. been flipped and telehealth has now become the primary. And uh, you know, I, I think we could all honestly say there's, there's no looking back at this point. Uh, your specialty is a pediatric neurologist, and, and one of the, the real reasons why we wanted to invite you to, to talk to our communities, and when I met you in person, I know you sought me out at, a, at a, I think it was a McCory meeting a couple of years ago. Yes, it was, yes. And, you know, usually when doctors see me at a meeting, they run the other way at the sleep meetings. So I, I, knew, I knew you were different right then. <laughs> there. <laughs> so, um, but what was amazing is when, you know, we were, we we're talking about, you know, what got you into sleep and, and your background from, from, from being out West in New Mexico and the dental and holistic perspective, mm-hmm. you know, I really brought in my horizons because this is what I've been looking for and what I've been searching for inside the sleep world. And that, not just that narrowed siloed, you know, everything poem, everything ENT, everything's, you know, allergy, asthma, but sure. that all these things are so co-mingled. And obviously, you know, your, your specialty is in neurology. So, you know, you're seeing primarily narco, narcolepsy patients, sure. which there are a lot of in our community. Sure. But, you know, I like to, you know, express to the public that, you know, narcolepsy is a, is a, is a rare disease, whereas we're talking sure. about a chronic disease. And a sure. chronic disease, and that means it overlaps with pretty much everyone and or someone in their family and or caregiver or workforce or, or anywhere else that they interact in society. Sure. So, you know, here's this amazing doctor, Dr. Morris, who's, who's got this dental background and, and then is, went into neurology and, and has come out of the, the Brown School of Medicine and, and, and it's got all these different places like you've dabbled in to get like to tap into the, the knowledge Sure. And, and, and you're, you're looking at the neurology, but you're also looking at the autism sure. and you're looking at the multi-inflammation and the fatigue and all these things that we hear about as symptoms and chicken or eggs. And sure, sure, sure. And I'll come up for breath and I'll say, I guess my first question really is with, with, with given that backstory as to why, you know, I really wanted to, to have this conversation today is, is what is really the prevalence of sleep apnea amongst our, amongst children these days that you're really seeing based on the standards that are set out there today? 
Sure. So, so one, um, just to provide some clarification, my background is um, as a child neurologist. Um, uh, the school that I went to is University of Medicine Dentistry of New Jersey. So sometimes people think that I have a dental, a specific <laughs> dental background, um, but I just want to uh, provide that clarification. Um, I had all my training in New Jersey and New York area um, and then had some opportunity to provide care in New Mexico. So did get a landscape uh, of a variety of different regions and have settled now in Pennsylvania. Uh, when I'm looking at patients who have sleep apnea in the pediatric population, um, it's estimated that about 50%, I'm sorry, it's estimated about 25 to 35% of children, neurotypical children, um, may have a sleep disorder. That sleep disorder can be a broad range of different types of sleep disorders, ranging from everything from insomnia, circadian rhythm disorders, parasomnia, such as sleepwalking, sleep talking, and also including um, uh, narcolepsy and, and sleep apnea. When talking about sleep apnea, apnea, the estimated statistics are about 3 to 5% of neurotypical children without any significant comorbidity will have obstructive sleep apnea. However, we recognize that those statistics may be varied depending on what other medical or um, uh, psychiatric conditions that a, a patient may have. Uh, what I mean by that is that we identify that the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea may be higher if the patient has um, a neurologic disorder such as epilepsy may be higher if they have a comorbid pulmonary disorder like asthma, um, and may be higher if they have a psychiatric um, diagnosis such as depression. So, you know, I know it all starts at pediatric sleep apnea, and I guess maybe I, I think one of the things I'd like to always clarify, and I know one of the first questions I asked you when, when we first met privately was, you know, where, where's really the, the, the dividing line between the, the, the SIDS, the scary SIDS, the sudden infant death syndrome, and pediatric sleep apnea? Is it, is it as simple as saying, you know, what, what I sometimes spat out to the public is that, you know, really the only difference from not that all SIDS is, it's really an umbrella for a lot of other things, sure. but that really the difference is that, a, is that a baby can roll over and catch its breath and not necessarily potentially self-suffocate. Is it that simple of, of a public health issue in education right now? Sure. So SIDS is, is unfortunately, I wish it was as simple a, as a, a conversation like that. It's a little bit more complex. Um, so sudden infant death syndrome, um, uh, there is a, I think, a relation that people will think of when they're talking about obstructive sleep apnea because there is a concern of um, uh, the discontinuation of breathing or an apnea. Uh, in children with SIDS, the research that was done out of Harvard um, has made some suggestion that um, the arousal centers in the brain that are, are or serotonergic or the neurotransmitter serotonin promoting the brain to be awake um, may be deficient in some of these babies who um, experience it. Uh, we don't truly have a full comprehension of what is the causative factor. We do see that there's sometimes this risk that runs in families. So it raises the question of, is there a genetic component? We sometimes might see sudden infant death syndrome, and then there might've been a history of a sibling who had SUNC, which is SUDC, which is sudden unexpected death in childhood, which just means that it occurred um, in an older child. Um, we also recognize that um, uh, some of the uh, guidelines that have been implemented to try and help in reducing the likelihood of SIDS have included um, putting the baby back to sleep. So putting the baby on their back when they're going to sleep, excluding anything else in the baby's um, bassinet or, or sleep place. Um, the most recent American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations was to keep the baby in the parent's bedroom for up to the first year to reduce the likelihood of SIDS. Um, and so uh, with those types of interventions, we'd have have seen a significant decrease in SIDS um, when looking at uh, individuals who have experienced SIDS. We have identified that there's other risk factors that are outside of the baby itself, such as if the parents um, may have been intoxicated either with drugs or alcohol, falling asleep in a in a chair or a couch, and a baby sliding down and, and experience suffocation. Uh, so it does seem to be much more multifactorial. Um, but again, sleep apnea also is multifactorial, as you're well aware. 
we recognize that um, historically we think of sleep apnea that it's the elderly gentleman who's overweight, who has a large neck and that they should be <sighs> making noises. We recognize that that's not necessarily the case. You may be the adult woman who's postmenopausal and that's contributing to a more floppy upper airway. You may be the child who maybe has autism spectrum disorder, who may also be of low tone and are unable to even generate that large snore. Um, and so we may see you more in the capacity of being a hypoventilator, maybe breathing kind of more shallow, um, or you may just not necessarily have that large snore. But when we study you, we identify that you're having very frequent episodes of reduced breathing, of arousals, of desaturations. Um, and that, again, is a call to action to say, what is the impact on these children? What is and, the impact of sleep apnea? And that's why I think your broad perspective and all the disciplines that you bring to the party, quite honestly, whether it's from the brain and is this a neurological thing? Is the brain not sending the signal? Is it an anatomical cranial facial issue? Is it an obstruction issue in, in the airway? And then to your point, you know, you know, kids don't necessarily have to have apnea. They don't necessarily <clears throat> snore. They're having right. probably more, you know, as with Dr. Gimeno coined, you know, the upper airways uh, resistance syndrome and, sure. and you know, really that, you know, we shouldn't be measuring kids necessarily the same way we measure adults. Because uh, sure. I, I can remember from my daughter in her own case, she had an AHI of 27 at two, I believe. Sure. And it wasn't that she had a lot of apneas, but it was the amount of hip hypotonias, the partial obstructions that were just sure. off the darts. Sure. And, and you're hundred percent correct. We don't, and, and that's why we don't measure them the same. So when we're talking about adult sleep apnea, we generally are saying that we're looking at someone who's having five to 15 um, uh, respiratory events, either apneas, hypopneas per hour to call them mild sleep apnea, 15 to 30 call them moderate, greater than 30 call them severe. And so when you think about that in the adult population, it's staggering to say that every other minute you're going to be having a respiratory event and then that's, and that's severe. Um, and that even a quarter of the time, that you can be having a respiratory event, that that's considered a mild degree of sleep apnea, it starts to kind of get on you of, that just doesn't make sense to even allow that. When we're looking at pediatrics, our thresholds are much lower. Um, so greater than one event an hour is considered sleep apnea in pediatrics. So between one and five is mild, five to 10 is moderate, and greater than 10 is severe. And I 100% agree with you, when we're looking at a child and any sleep disturbance, we have to be concerned because we recognize that sleep has such a critical influence on neurodevelopmental outcomes. And so when we are influencing sleep in a negative way, we are often so negatively influencing the trajectory of how someone's going to be able to learn in school, how they're going to be able to stabilize their mood, the decision-making that they're going to have. Um, and so we're really making them a setup as a failure if we're not surveillancing and we're not diagnosing and we're not actively treating children who may be suffering from a sleep problem, such as sleep apnea. From theoretically, potentially day one, if we eventually- 100%. To the genetic, you know, point where we can screen, you know, whether it's saliva or even look at the mothers that are having issues in their third trimesters with the, the gestational diabetes or any other uh, or preeclampsia issues that we know that are red flags for, you know, sure. I know that gets into some of your autism work, which, you know, which is you know, a favorite subject of mine right now, because I think that if, if mom's not getting oxygen or is hypoxic or is holding on to too much CO2, I, I can only imagine in my layman's brain what that's doing to our genetics uh, you know, what has happened to these kids. So I, I, I mean, you know, I, I just don't want to see children that are, that are popping because, you know, most pediatric sleep apnea, and this is one of the other messages I always like to get out there. They don't present necessarily as, as tired. They're hyperactive. Sure. And so that, that's one of the things that's very interesting is that sleepiness has many faces. And so most of us think about the adult presentation of sleepiness, where it's the person who's dragging at work, they're having uh, maybe even some sleep intrusions during the day, kind of dozing off, having a hard time maintaining in conversation. Children, it's a wide spectrum. So it can range everything from the child who looks almost like an ADHD, hyperactive. And many times I'll even give an analogy um, to my own child who's three years old now of what does she look like when she's tired 
and I pause and I say, the devil, because she is nonstop and will be going until she hits a wall. Um, and then if you physically keep her still, she's out like that. Um, and so that's a compensatory mechanism. If I keep moving, if I keep um, dodging my seat, uh, I actually will not fall asleep. It also can look like ADHD inattentive type where I'm um, not able to focus and pay attention. The other challenges is depending on the age of the uh, of the child, if they're an adolescent, sometimes sleeping looks, looks like you're quote unquote typical teenager, right? Where they're moody and they're um, irritable and they have a hard time connecting with others because we recognize sleepiness interferes with our interpersonal relationships. And so uh, being vigilant and being able to educate and understand that sleepiness has many faces and to not ignore it, to meet it head on, and then to understand what is the underlying etiology of it so that you can appropriately teach it, treat it, is really, really quite quite important. And, and I think, and I, it's great that you're talking about your own daughter right over your shoulder. Uh, it, it reminds me, and I, and I, and I forget because my daughter is, you know, turning 13 at the end of the year, but we've been at this almost 11 years. And as sure. you know, we've, this September, we're going to previewing a, a father-daughter video about, you know, my journey, you know, and, then, and how that sort of enlightened her, her interventions at a much earlier age. And I, I can remember just, you know, you know, after the, the first intervention of the, the tonsil and adenoids and having those removed, what kind of child I had, and then expanding the airway and, you know, now looking at her now and, you know, she was literally last night, uh, I woke up this morning, I'm like, what's she doing in my bed? My wife's like, she was in your bed all night. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what, what's amazing is I never heard her. The mouth yeah. was closed. She was asleep. And I was like, wow, yeah. this, this is, this is not what I remember because I was a kid, you know, waking myself up. Sure. So to come back to this, you know, we're in this COVID area, we're stuck at home, we're stuck maybe with our parents or these generations. What better time to start to educate everybody about 100%. what to look for? A hundred percent. So I think that um, uh, we, we're always trying to look at the silver lining on COVID, right? This has been a historical event that has been traumatic to, I think, everyone involved. And so trying to find those silver linings of where can we go from here, um, you a hundred percent identify one of those silver linings, which is now is a call to action to be able to have a discussion about sleep, being able to be home, to be able to see how your children are sleeping, being able to tell people there this is the appropriate number hours your child should be sleeping um, and surveillancing for whether or not they're snoring, uh, surveillancing, surveillancing for things like waking up multiple times a night, uh, things like bedwetting, which can also be a sign of obstructive sleep apnea in a child who had previously been potty trained. Uh, any of these types of features are very helpful uh, in being able to look for. Thank you for reminding me about that because I always forget that that's one of the telltale. I remember when, the, you know, the terrible twos. I'm like, no, I think my daughter is not feeling well. She's having autoimmune, autoinflammatory responses. We're doing the same traditional course of treatments, the steroids, you know, and this stuff's not working. Got, yeah, and and I, as I remembered, as we started really looking at this with, okay, let's treat the sleep, sure. everything else started improving. So even one of the questions early on was, Okay, we got we we did a, a surgical intervention, but it didn't eliminate it because she still had sure. an apnea of about twelve. And you said anything over one is abnormal. Sure, sure. you know. Sure. And Dr. Gimeno used to say any any child that breathes with his or her mouth open is a red flag. Uh, 100%. I remember I remember seeing my daughter Mia sleep in child's pose at a young age and 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 not understanding why. And and I remember I remember Justine, my wife, asking Dr. Gimeno, he's, he's like, "That's not in the what to expect when you're expecting book." And, and <laughs> And she's like, what's that? She's like, you know, the reason children stick their butts up in the air is they're letting their tongues fall forward. They're forcing air into their diaphragm. They're already self-protecting. I'm like, if we just taught every mother that or every school sure. nurse that, sure. how much earlier would we be preventing all these other comorbidities? And then the final piece, and I'll come up for air, was, you know, he, I, I asked him, I go, if it was your granddaughter, what would you do? I go, I'm more worried about her brain developing and getting oxygen and going through full cycles of sleep than anything that I could potentially do to stick a pediatric mask on her face. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that I would say is that um, what you describe in terms of per parents not necessarily understanding um, what to look for is not too dissimilar what, what had historically been seen with obstructive sleep apnea in, in adults. So historically, we used to think of it as a comical encounter. And uh, there was even some historical documentation to say that it was even reason for a potential divorce. Um, and so when we're looking at children and we see that they're drooling and their mouth's open and their heads are back or they're uh, assuming unusual 
unusual poses. It's cute because they're little and it's funny. And it's something that you remark on, even take pictures of. Um, But then when you recognize the implications of that, it's um, really quite important. I think one of the things that um, I sometimes will even get asked about in terms of the neonatal period and being concerned about breathing is whether or not a pacifier is a good or not a good thing to incorporate. Um, And so there's pros and cons to it. So there is some suggestion that using a pacifier may help in stimulating a better um, breathing pattern. The concern, though, that we have when someone's uh, a child is constantly using either their thumb or a pacifier or anything in their mouth is that you're forcing the um, uh, the palate to potentially develop around that. And so you may end up with a higher arched palate, which then when we have a higher arched palate, we have a more narrow face like myself. And then when you have a narrow face, that is how your airway is developing, more narrow. And so the reason that you and your daughter went through all of this work to have palate expansion is because we recognize when we expand the palate, we're expanding the airway, we're decreasing the likelihood of uh, collapsibility. The challenge with the pacifier question is that we don't know how much of the pro outweighs how much of the con, and um, that has just not been systemically, um, systematically, I'm sorry, not systemically, (laughs) systematically studied um, to be able to say, um, uh, do you give, do you not give? I would say that what's really important in that scenario is is that it's also not only the child's piece, but the mother's piece, because mothers who are having insufficient sleep, they can have um, poor decision-making, and that can put the child at risk. So we really have to look at it from a family dynamic. We can't be pigeonholed. Um, Another thing that I think is really important to acknowledge is I had made a, a comment earlier about ADHD and sleep apnea. There is a bi-directional relationship between ADHD and sleep, and that is one that if, if someone's watching this um, and if they can take home one point, I would say this is a really important one. It's so important that the American Academy of Pediatrics even came out with a guideline statement on this of saying that if you are evaluating someone with a, um, a, a symptoms of ADHD before initiating stimulant therapy, please evaluate their sleep. And that that guideline was actually made specifically because of um, obstructive sleep apnea, because we recognize that when you look at the ENT literature, that children who had obstructive sleep apnea and comorbid ADHD who underwent a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, that in many of these series, that up to 50% of them were able to come off of their stimulant. And so recognizing again, that the face of sleepiness can be so many different faces. Um, It's also important to recognize that I don't want people to limit themselves of thinking ADHD and only obstructive sleep apnea. It is good to think of ADHD in the context of sleep overall, because that bi-directional relationship, Sleepiness can look like ADHD. And so identifying, is this narcolepsy? Is this obstructive sleep apnea? Is this some other reason for insufficient sleep? But on top of that, that children who have ADHD, true ADHD, generally it's a dis, a, a self-regulation disorder. And so those children have a hard time winding down, getting themselves asleep. So it's not uncommon that they're having difficulty falling asleep. And so then when we're introducing a stimulant can further perpetuate that problem. So really looking at it is a give and take. It goes in both directions. I, I, so, I'm so happy I'm a Gen X child and that, that I came from a generation when you were bouncing off walls. I told you to go outside and run and do all this stuff because obviously I was I was a poster child sure. for this and so were all my friends. Sure. Uh, but I want to take it a step back and as a representative of a patient advocacy association, I want to see the American Academy of Pediatrics take even a further step. I don't want to see guidelines. I want to see policy. I don't want any kid put on a stimulant and anybody changing brain chemistry until the sleep workup has been factored into the whole story. Sure, Um, sure. And I, and I think that I think that you definitely have a very interesting call to action um, in that regard because of, of the bi-directional relationship, of recognizing that when you're introducing a treatment that it can potentially affect the sleep. I think that a baseline um, evaluation of, of sleep is, is definitely uh, very much warranted. And I think that this is an area that we're still trying to understand more because we don't understand why there's some children of ADHD who do have these significant comorbid sleep issues. Um, we, we also don't understand why do some children have obstructive sleep apnea, they may look relatively asymptomatic where others look so severely symptomatic. Um, And so there's all of these pieces of data that we're still trying to figure out. Um, And I think that it does take that relationship between clinical providers, researchers, and patients and advocacy groups to be able to come together and say, where is, where are these calls to action to be able to look at and uh, better direct patient care? 
Well, it's, it's we're not treating for the masses. We start to get, eventually get to treat to that end of one where we're giving precise, the right interventions for the right person at the right time. And, and we, we have enough information that if we coalesce it all and we bring the end user at that, whether it's the parent or, or the patient or the, or the caregiver as, as the focal point, then we can start to make the best choices. I mean, we know the dental world should be screening for all of this, you know, to come back yeah. to Alice's question uh, who, who works for our awake virtual support team, you know, is ADHD and, 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 the, and the pacifier and the high upper palate are, are these things connected? Sure. I mean, my, my, one of my litmus is I don't need an 8,000 hour in lab sleep study. I don't need a $500 home study. I can stick my tongue all the way up and show people the higher up your tongue, your, your thumb goes in your mouth, the higher up you're pushing your septum up into your nose, a la the deviated septum. Uh, so that's a great telltale. Now, I wasn't a thumb sucker, but I also wasn't breastfed, which is a whole nother fork in the road and, and component sure. towards building these bricks at these foundations when we start. Sure. The sure. tongue tie, is that is that another place that we should be looking at and screening and finding out once and for all what, what, what we can do and help people uh, and young kids that are having stutter, speech pathology problems. Sure. Uh, the bedwetting, I mean, I always tell m- moms and dads, I'm like, listen, if be happy they're bedwetting because that's their body's way of waking them up. Mm-hmm. When they don't do it, then you got a bigger problem. Mm-hmm. So we know we can fix that. Let's treat the sleep. It's not the kid's problem. It's not a psychological problem. It's a biological problem. Sure, well, sure. The child, you know. So I agree I'm with you. I'm <laughs> So, no, I, I completely agree with you. Um, in terms of some of the, the suggestions of um, what do we do in terms of the anatomy of an individual, I agree with you. That has to be individualized. I agree that when we are identifying a child who has sleep apnea, um, trying to have an understanding of what is the appropriate dynamic for treatment, um, is this a child who has enlarged tonsils and adenoids? Does that need to be um, remedied? If it does need to be remedied, you need to be studying those patients afterwards to ensure that the sleep apnea went away. And then if it didn't, what is the next best treatment? And so this is not necessarily a fixed management because we are not dealing with fixed individuals. I always explain to whether it's my neurology patients or my sleep patients that I am dealing with a moving target. A child is on a neurodevelopmental trajectory physically, biologically, um, cognitively. And so we need to move with them and we need to ebb and flow with them. And so they may not necessarily be a candidate for a maxillary expander now. So you may do a temporary measure of of using some sort of positive airway pressure. Um, But we're recognizing there's pros and cons to everything we do. Um, And we need to just be confident enough in a transparent relationship with our patients to say, this is the management now. We need to re-meet, and that's the whole reason for continued follow-up, to say, are we doing the right thing now, or do we need to revisit what are the therapeutic options? And the beautiful thing about medicine is that therapeutic options are constantly being challenged and constantly being re-interrogated to be able to say, yes, we're giving you the best in care that's available now, but it's not necessarily the best in care that will ever be available. Uh, And so I I 100% uh, agree that it's a combination of having that conversation and then keep challenging the science behind what is the decision making that we're making. And I can tell you as a, as a N01, as for me, and then for what we learned from my daughter 10 years later, what we now know is what we could have done for her at two or three. Yes, we would have probably still done tonsils and adenoids because that was an obvious sure. the benefit outweighed the risk, you know, and that's, that's, that's the exception in this generation. But sure. if we could have got this transpalatal expander in and not just separated the teeth, which, you know, we're doing a good job of, of expanding from here to here in the dental world. But it's, it's this part that, that since I had the same procedure, it's a little bit more invasive for me because we had to score the bone. Sure. But I know overnight and just going through allergy season and, and, and barometric change and living in the tropics, I don't feel the bone pressure, the sinus stuff. All my sure. plumbing is fixing and, work, and, and, and breathing better. I think that's also given me a better opportunity to prevent from getting COVID. Not that it's foolproof. My immune okay. system's strong. So I, I remember with, with Mia, you know, one of the first things that popped was she was having a napkin psoriasis and she was having, you know, terrible twos and, and all this stuff. And, 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 and we didn't understand the sleep component. And once we took care of that, the inflammation went away. Sure. 
Sure. And so I think I think you bring up an excellent point of recognizing that what we're now recognizing is that sleep is invasive to all processes in the human body. And um, one of the things that I commonly will do when I'm giving either a talk or trying to educate families on why it's so important to focus on sleep, because let's face it, the national mindset is sleep is optional. I'll sleep when I'm dead. I can get a lot more done. This I can sacrifice getting five hours of sleep to be able to get more done during the day. But the reality is, is the analogy that one should keep in mind is that sleep is what we call homeostatic process. What is that? That's big fancy terms for saying that this is a process that your your body needs to go through in order to maintain stability. What is an example of another homeostatic process? That homeostatic process is your body's temperature. You're, you should be a 98.6 body temperature. And as a physician, if I had a patient come in and their temperature was 104 or 94, I would look at that as saying, we need to do something. And why am I saying that? Not because of those absolute numbers. I could care less about 104 or 94. I care more about what those numbers represent. Those numbers represent that your body is in gross dysfunction. And without recognizing and intervening, you are on a trajectory that is really poor, that will lead to significant morbidity, mortality, and we need to remedy that. The same thing is true of if I have a person who's supposed to be getting eight hours of sleep a night and they're coming in getting 14 or four hours, that same call to action should be coming sizzling in your body of saying, I need to identify why is it that you're getting 14 or four hours and we need to work together to align and say, let's get you back to what your body needs. So um, I think it's really very important when you throw your body temperature out of whack, we worry about every single organ system in your body. When your sleep is out of whack, you should have those same concerns. And and when you're talking about that pro-inflammatory state where people are more susceptible to potentially disease and how they would battle that disease, you're a hundred percent correct. Um, but there's there's a whole ar- uh, array of disorders that we would need to worry about. Right. And, and we just don't know what's on the table because we're all genetically predisposed to X, Y, and Z. A hundred percent. And so that's where that precision medicine does come into play of recognizing that there's definitely genetic predispositions to the development of diseases, development of sleep disorders, having certain patterns of sleep, number of hours of sleep. Um, And we need to uh, uh, be able to manage patients based on what their needs are, not necessarily just based on what the masses are. We use that to help guide the initial conversations, but then we need to be able to uh, specifically manage the person in front of us. You know, I think you sort of touched on something with the temperature, and I know we've, we've been talking about it inside the sleep field, is what, what is that sleep sort of biomarker? What is that indicator? There's, you know, we know that it takes a lot of different things to make up the whole total sleep picture, but just like when we go to the doctor and they take our blood pressure, they listen to the heart, what, what is that one thing that we can report on? Because we know AHI is not what it needs to be. No, 100%. <laughs> something that was developed a long time ago that, unfortunately, it's 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 – we learned a lot from it, but it's it's we know where it's where it's got right and what it's got wrong. Yes, yes, and and I think that that's something definitely that our field is looking at um, of saying that we're leaving so much. Even when you're looking at polysomnography or a sleep study at night, we're leaving so much data on the table. You're 100 percent correct. We report on the apnea hypopnea index, which is the number of times per hour that someone is having a sleep disturbance. Um, but we tend to leave so much data on the table. What does the brain look like in terms of the EEG, the electrical activity of the brain? What is the leg movements like? What is the heart rhythm pattern? Um, is there any evidence of cardiac rhythm problems? Um, And so we tend to leave that information on the table of not um, utilizing that to better phenotype or describe the characteristics of the person who has sleep sleep disorder breathing. The thing that's so exciting is that right now I have the privilege of working with a lot of leaders in the field. um, And so I'm privy to a lot of um, the extraordinary work that they're doing to have this better insight. And so I can say that 100%, we're not only looking at different genotypes or genetic factors that may influence, we're also looking at the proteomics and metabolomics, so proteins that your body is making and how they're utilizing energies uh, to be able to identify those biomarkers so that we would potentially at one day be able to say, we can draw your blood and tell you what you need. Um, and so I, I think that when we talk about that, we almost think of like sci-fi, this is so far out, um, never going to happen. But I do think that it is on the horizon. I do think that the research is going there. Um, and we're working very diligently to better qualify and quantify these relationships so that we can um, develop more precise management uh, schemas for our patients. 
you know, I, I almost in this, in this, in this craziness that's going on with COVID now and with the different iterations of the antibody test and, 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 sure. and, and the blood test, you know, and now there, you know, I know there, there's a new saliva test that's being used. Sure. You know, you know, if, if we had unity and we had leadership and cohesion, I, I could see, you know, an entire United States uh, genetic study going on right now that sure. everyone would be participating because you'd be testing everybody and you, we'd finally once and for all not have an all white, Sure. You would have, you know, true representation of all walks of life, all 50 states, all, you know, city, rural, uh, you name it. Uh, sure. and, and, and I think we're, 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 we're on the verge of that as one of the terrible horrors and tragedies that comes out of this. I think there will be a lot of good science that comes that does come out of it. Uh, sure. And I'm excited about that. But yeah, you know, there was one other thought I wanted to go back to. And, you know, it's just more that back to that public health and, and sleep education awareness for those parents that are out there listening. Your child that's sleeping 12, 14 hours a day, that's the red flag. Mm-hmm. It's not that it might, it might be good that they're catching up on sleep, but if they're consistently doing that, that doesn't, that means they're not getting good quality sleep. So we, it's, it's that whole quality quantity thing that people really need to start to appreciate and, and, and factor in to their decision-making and their cognitive ability. Sure. Because I, I think we forget with this sleep deprivation, we're cognitively impaired that we, we make the wrong decisions, the errors, the, the, the mistakes. Sure. Sure. And, and I think in terms of um, uh, looking at your children and what number of hours of sleep, it's important to recognize that there's age appropriate number of hours of sleep. So if your child is between ages of one and three, 10 to 13 hours might be appropriate for them. And it may be occurring all at once, or it may be fragmented um, with a daytime nap and um, uh, the consolidate, most of the consolidation at nighttime. Um, I would point out though, that if your child by the age of five, most children should be having all of their nighttime sleep consolidated. So if you're seeing persistent napping or reemergence of napping, that could could potentially be a concern about the quality or quantity of sleep um, because we do recognize that when you have the newborn baby who's having fragments of sleep across 24 hours and it may equal anywhere between up to like 16 to 19 hours in a day, that's very normal. Um, but we're seeing that that tends to uh, become less number of hours and more consolidated. Uh, and so just being aware of uh, looking at your own child's individual patterns and if you're seeing any regressions or significant changes, that potentially could be a, a major your uh, red flag. Yeah, I, I could even remember for myself, you know, just the, the fibromyalgia in the, you know, I didn't see the inflammation on my skin, but I felt it. Sure. And I knew as soon as I started getting, I was like, where did all this mystery pain? And I was trying to, and I was chasing my tail for years. Sure. The pain and, 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 you know, it was an athlete. Oh, this is what's, what's, uh, what do they say in the NFL? They're, are you hurt or are you in pain? <laughs> there's, there's, there's a big difference. Sure, sure, <laughs> you know? sure, sure. Sure. So um, it looks like we have some questions from uh, Jennifer, I see, um, regards to uh, insurance companies. Um, it's t- it's Her comment is, is we, uh, she has to uh, pull walrus teeth just to get coverage for diagnostic testing. I'll let you speak to this as a physician and as someone who works in a, in a, in a really interesting uh, one-stop shop health healthcare system. And, and I'll tell you what I sort of think. Uh, I'm a big fan of testing in-house at home, on the wrist, whatever it may be. I just want people to be getting the correct information. And when I, when I say that, I mean, I have a lot of people walking around with, depending upon what wearable, thinking they know what stage of sleep they're in. And, and what I mean by that is you cannot measure the brain on a wrist. Until we develop and find and have medical grade approved wireless EEG, there's nothing at home to tell us what stage of sleep we're in. Now, okay. the home sleep studies can tell us how we're doing with our breathing, our cardiac, and a lot of great information, but they do not give us the EEG, or am I incorrect when I say that? So so they're not, so um, I'll 100% give full disclosure that um, if you talked to me a year ago, I was 100% against uh, home sleep testing, uh, mainly because of the fact that as a neurologist, I'm biased, uh, I do want the EEG leads on, uh, okay. because I do think that that gives us a fuller picture of what's going on. Um, there are some uh, sleep devices that have uh, proprietary algorithms that they have studies to suggest that they can make some extrapolation 
population based on the uh, waveforms that are developed that could give some estimation of what the sleep stages are. Um, again, this is something that I'm only coming full circle to have a little bit more of acceptance on. Um, and that really, again, is is uh, um, a la COVID <laughs> uh, because of the fact that um, for the protection of my patients, I'm much more interested in keeping them safe in whatever capacity and being able to still achieve the diagnosis that may be necessary for them. Uh, in terms of the question that was presented of that, uh, sleep is not a priority for insurance companies. Unfortunately, that's a reflection of, um, uh, I think, how we have presented sleep just to the medical society in general. So what do I mean by that? If you take a medical education, uh, only about three to four hours over the entire four years of medical school is directed at sleep education. When you look specifically at pediatric sleep, it's about 17 minutes. When you look at the, the average residency program, um, uh, upwards of 25% of, say, pediatric residency programs don't even include any um, education about or, or structured education about pediatric sleep. When you look at neurology programs, there's an increased number, but when you look at the the actual specifics of the type of education. It's generally an elective rotation. And in general, it's usually two weeks that is spent. Um, and there may only be one or two providers that they have access to. So in general, not really getting a fulminant uh, impression of the relevance of sleep. And, uh, and I think those are two fields that are very representative of, of fields that sleep is so critically important. So when we are, as a field, are not demanding greater attention to sleep and integrating it into how we're managing our patients for extra sleep disorders, what I mean by that is disorders that are not primarily sleep issues, but recognizing that sleep influences the control and the management um, or potential outcomes of these diseases, then uh, insurance companies have a greater degree of saying, should I be investing in looking for this? Because if I can't understand why it changes management for my patient or my, uh, that I'm insuring, and I can't understand how it's going to change the metrics or the risk stratification for this patient, um, then it becomes less important to me. So I think that um, I, I would love to be able to just blame insurance companies alone because they would allow me to be this, a, a scapegoat and say, oh, it's no one else's fault. But the reality is it is a, a combined effort. I think that you need to have all the key stakeholders come together and say, what is the priority on sleep and, and what do we need to do in order to elevate sleep to being at the same level that we look at cardiovascular outcomes, cancer outcomes, diabetic outcomes, et cetera, sleep it has a role in every single one of those. And so until we're able to say we're bringing sleep up to the table and that it has the same importance, we're going to continue to see these struggles of insurances putting it at as a lesser priority. Because unfortunately, as a field, um, the, the field of sleep medicine has been put at a lesser priority. And it's through no fault of um, they're not being interested by sleep physicians. I think it's really that... We, us as sleep physicians and sleep researchers have done a great job of talking to one another, but have not done as great of a job of really infiltrating all of the other fields that we have recognized and have documented influence um, their disease outcomes. Uh, I can say a big amen to that. You know, we're, I think we're on our fifth or sixth year of sleep timber coming up, uh, the month of awareness. And, it, and, and it's, it's, it's about, you know, not just sleep apnea, but about this other sleep disorders 100%. and chicken and the egg and, and all the comorbidities and the prevention and the health and the wellness and the, you know, the performance in school and on the field. And, you know, this year we'll be doing it again. I think we're at one of our, our viral things we're going to try is the apple bite challenge. I want people to be aware of the bite. Because I know now when I bite into an apple and when my daughter bites in, now that she's had all these interventions, it's twice as wide. <laughs> um, I know we're, we're at like 40 minutes. We're at 40 minutes and I want to be respective of your time. And I know we can't talk about this all in one day. And I think we, we, we see you have a lot to talk about going forward because we have a sure. new on vaccines, that sure. hot topic that'll, that'll come out of COVID. Sure. Um, I want to thank you for from the bottom of my heart, I think this is, you present it in a way in, in English when, you know, when mostly when we're used to talking to neurologists, you know, it's usually a very maternal, paternal, you know, up at sure. the high mountain and it's hard to speak English and, and you do do an amazing job of just breaking it down to where even, you know, someone as chronically sleep deprived as I've been my whole life that, you know, can actually make, retain it. Um, so, I, 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 and I know if I'm retaining it, I know everyone else is and, and that, that's, that, sure. that, that, you know, I want us to be the facilitator for that. So that, you know, that, that comment you made about 17 minutes of, of, of teaching of pediatric sleep, 
that's the most depressing thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and yeah. I'm laughing, but I, it's sad. And, and you know, I agree. That, that, that's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Until we make sleep a priority, like all the other, you know, like nutrition and like, and like, and like fitness, Sure. You know, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna get that respect. And you know, I'll say this, and you know this better than anyone. No one took sleep seriously until it was tied to cardio cardiovascular outcomes. A hundred percent. And and thank God it has been. But let's yes. do a job as a field. You know, there are always going to be sleep disorders and specialists that we need. But let's do a job as a field and come together and and be the pie pipers and go out to the primary care physician, go to the, the pediatrics, go to the ENT societies, go to the dental societies. Go to the pulmonologist, go to the, you know, whoever it is that we cradle to grave, chronic to rare overlap with, we got to make sure that sleep is a, it's one third of our lives. Mm -hmm. And for and for our children, it's even more than that. So if, so we say one third because that's the estimate for adults, but the reality is it's um, sometimes fifty to seventy five percent of our children's lives. Um, wow, so really recognizing I never about it like that. So really recognizing that importance. Um, and that's so really. I I would really just like to say thank you for the opportunity to be on here, um, expressing my my understanding and my opinions. This is a representation of of just myself, not my institute, um, and so I do uh, really appreciate that. Uh, and look forward to the opportunity to speak with you guys again in the future. I, I can't thank you so much. I'm so happy to hear that you're safe and sound in Philadelphia and that, 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 that you're fighting a good fight for us. Uh, you. I, you know, I, I know I, I mentioned Sleep Timber coming up, and we'd love to have you participate with that in the, in the sure. pediatric aspect. And i also like to remind our, you know, anybody that's watching that we have uh, our, our, our CPAP mask supply program for anyone that's, that's short of masks. Uh, for, for, you know, a tenth of the price, you can get them, uh, some of the sample factory sealed masks that we still have in our Minnesota Fulfillment Center. So please check us out at sleepapnea.org. Um, also become a member so you can get uh, announcements and access to when we do uh, speaker series with, with experts like Dr. Morse and, uh, and participate in our podcasts, our newsletters, our blogs, and any of our online forums or Facebooks or anywhere you want to come and, and find out about sleep. Uh, we try to meet you where you're at, but we also invite you to come and, and, and become a member and, and hopefully we'll, we'll develop a relationship as we go and, and, and help, help make sleep a priority in, in all of our lives and especially in the pediatric world because rare exceptional doctors like Dr. Morse are, are, are one of a kind right now. And, and I want her not to be the exception. I want her to be the rule. I want to train an army of, 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 of doctors like her that, that every mom, every grandmother, uh, knows what we're doing for children and how that sleep, if it really represents 50 to 70% of our life, especially early, if we don't make that a priority and make sure it's good quality sleep, uh, yes. we're putting our, all ourselves behind the eight ball from day one. Yes, I agree with you. Thank you. So, thank you so much, doctor. Have a good day. Be safe. And until the next time. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleepapnea.org slash donate for details. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And you could check out some of our other videos.